This is uh, the first lecture of a series on characteristic classes. I think of this as a, akin to an open textbook on, um, on the subject. Um, so it's gonna be uh, used in a class at the University of Oregon where I'm a faculty member. My name is uh, Dev Sinha or Dave, if you're uh, from the Indian subcontinent. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, this is a, a basic subject in, um, well, somewhat advanced algebraic topology. Um, it's a subject that arises in differential geometry, algebraic geometry, um, and all throughout um, algebraic topology and geometric topology. So um, we regularly uh, offer it as a course. And this year I'm um, recording lectures and then going deeper with my students, but um, recording the lectures for anybody who would like to um, see my take on the subject. Um, that take on the, the subject is deeply indebted to Milner and Stashev's text, <coughs> um, which uh, is what I learned from. Um, and that's just uh, called the same characteristic classes. Um, and so I'll often talk about uh, where in the text this may roughly correspond to, although I'll be having my own take on things in particular, I'm going to be um, in some ways uh, more true to the, the, the um, beginnings of the subject by using what I call tome cochains in order to define these classes. Um, Milner and Stashev take a more axiomatic point of view for a while before um, uh, giving a definition, which is uh, relies on steamroad operations. And so um, I, try, I wanna be more direct. Um, we'll also uh, take the point of view, which is actually closer to Steenrod's view of the subject at the time of uh, really sort of highlighting uh, the theory of classifying spaces and its role. So those are a couple differences, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, as we go along, I'll also uh, sometimes refer to parts of the, the text that I'm um, doing a, a variant of when I give my lecture. Today, that would be uh, the second chapter. So uh, the goal in lecture today is to, um, to just, uh, I always like to be able to capture in a sentence or two what a subject is about, um, and then also why it might be important and things like that. And what characteristic classes do is they measure vector bundles um, using or by through cohomology. So that's what characteristic classes do. And, and the main goal today is to have that um, make some sense. So um, as well as give some motivation for why we would wanna do this measure vector bundles, whatever they are. Well, so the first thing to say is, well, what is a vector bundle? And we'll get to that definition formally in a bit, but I wanna start with examples and then get to definitions, but then just, So informally, vector bundles, they, um, you can think of them as parameterized families of vector spaces. And the other way I like to, um, think about them, um, motivate them. They're um, suitable targets for twisted functions and by twisted functions um, we'll we'll see that what I really mean is sections which we'll define. So they're, they're twisted objects, ways you can kind of twist a space together with some vector spaces. Think of maybe a semi-direct product as, as an example of a, as, as a kindred spirit to a, a vector bundle. 
Um, so let's give some examples. Um, the one I like to bring up first, the easiest one to get your mind around at the very first is the Mobius bundle. And what that is, is I'm gonna take an interval and cross it with the real numbers and then take one end of the interval, which is a copy of the real numbers and identify it with the other, the copy of the real numbers at, um, at the other end, but I'm gonna put a twist, that, minus, that last little minus sign. So, um, So, so here, what we're going to do is, again, take an interval, take a copy of the real numbers, and this copy of the real numbers is going to be identified with that one. Um, so, so if you try to picture this, you get something like, well, let's just look just close to the origin. Of all the copy of each copy of the real numbers. Well, if I take a strip and I have a twist um, identification, I get a Mobius band. Um, so this is really uh, then once you continue outwards and you have full copies of the real numbers, you have the Mobius bundle. Um, so that's an example. And um, let's look at our informal definitions. It's a parameterized family of vector spaces. That just means uh, for every point in my parameter space, I've got a vector space. What is the parameter space this, in this case? Well, it is the circle. Because if I look at this, uh, say, copy of the circle here, Taking zero in every vector space gives me um, some space, which will be our parameter space. Then for every point in the parameter space, I've got a copy of a vector space, in this case, R1. So, okay, so I've got a copy of R1 and it is twisted in this case. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be twisted. The, the trivial vector bundle is a vector bundle. But in this case, we see that, yes, I've got a twisted family of, um, of vector spaces. I, as I go around, um, the, I still have a vector space at every point, place, but um, that identification of vector spaces becomes non-trivial. One thing we'll see here is that this automorphism of the real numbers, sending x to minus x is, is, um, is what keeps track of this twisting by definition in this case. And, and it's what you want to think of uh, how there is twisting in a vector bundle in general. What we're measuring is, is, is those automorphisms. Um, as far as being a suitable target for, for twisted functions, so there's uh, what we can call as a section is a choice of a point in the vector space. And so um, let's see, I guess I'll draw it in purple here. So for every point, I can take a point in the fiber and it's some, some function like that. Maybe here it would look like this, but just notice that um, as I cross the end, I get twisted. So my section actually to be consistent function. So it's, it's if you will, anti-periodic. Um, normally to be a function on a circle, if I draw it on the interval zero one, I have to end up where I started. Here I have to end up, um, if that's x, then the other end is minus x for, for the value of that function. Okay, so that's uh, a first example, that Mobius bundle. Um, a second example is, uh, well, a general example, and historically, in, in general, the most important example, I would say, are tangent bundles. And what is a tangent bundle? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to consider a manifold for now just embedded in some Euclidean space, R capital N. And um, then the tangent bundle 
is going to uh, for us be a subspace of m cross rn. And this is going to be, so this is a space of pairs. It's a Cartesian product. Um, so I need to tell you what pairs of uh, points in the manifold and vectors in Rn um, I choose. And namely, well, the points are, of course, in the manifold. And then the vector is a tangent vector of a curve. So for some. I can just say it goes from R to M or just a small interval around zero to M with um, gamma of zero at M. Okay, so that's one way to say it. So these, these are now points um, uh, in M paired with vectors in R N. And oops. so if this is R M, then um, I've got a point and then I consider any possible curve gamma and gamma prime of zero is something I'm uh, assuming we are familiar with. It's gonna be some vector because this is inside R capital N. So that is gamma prime of zero. So all those pairs. So let's give an example of the example. An example of the example is, um, is the two sphere. Let's just embed it in R3 in the standard way, the way we usually define it. So then um, we're saying that the tangent bundle of S2 is sitting inside of um, S2 cross R3. And what is it? Well, I've got a point X in S2. I could think of that as a vector, actually, and a point V in R3. And if we look at the, um, the two sphere, and we think about um, this is our X. It's the end of that vector, but let's consider the vector from 0 to X. Um, and then any curve, gamma, going through it, that tangent vector is going to be um, a basic fact in geometry of spheres is that's going to be perpendicular to, um, to x. So you can very explicitly say this is just the, um, the, the, the space so that V is perpendicular to X. It's the way I prefer to say it. Um, X is sort of the independent variable, so to speak. V is the dependent variable. And for every X, I look at the, the, the perpendiculars. That just so happens to be the tangent bundle of the sphere. So for, and the way we also sort of just sketch it, let me put another copy of S2 here, is for every point, I've got this vector space that, of course, extends infinitely, but I usually just sort of, I almost think of it as a post-it note at that point in the manifold. Um, with, the, with the implicitly, it could extend indefinitely. Um, okay, so that's, that's a great example. We can think of it as very concrete. Really, it's some four-dimensional subspace of a five-dimensional space, so we can't fully visualize it in a naive sense, but, um, but if we think of a pair of a point on S2 and we can think about that. And, and, the, and the tricky part is that in this, in this uh, schematic, this vector space right now is, um, is not a vector space. It's not a subspace of um, R3 as I've drawn it. So, so let, me, let me perhaps say there's a little bit of a warning around this picture, because really we must translate. I think I'm drawing this at 
the point x, but a linear space at x in R3 is not gonna be a vector subspace. And, and the vector structure is gonna be important here. You get, I think, an equivalent theory, actually, if you only look for affine structures, in which case as an affine kind of object, this makes sense, um, looking at that, uh, that affine linear subspace of R3 associated to that point X. But that's certainly not the, the historical um, approach and not what, the one we're gonna take because it's clear just to think about, um, uh, again, vector spaces instead of affine spaces. So really in this picture, this plane is, even though I, I, I have translated it across the origin, or away, from, even though, even though it doesn't live um, naturally at the origin, there is an implied sort of translation here for any uh, affine linear subspace. You um, translate it to the origin, you'll get a vector subspace. And in fact, I've got a preferred one because the point X is uh, in this affine linear space, and I can then translate by translation by uh, adding the additive inverse of X. And then I'm um, now at the origin and I've got this plane going through. Okay, um, so let's think about uh, the, the informal definition given for a vector bundle. Um, as I said, you've got uh, two ways to, to start thinking about it. It's first of all, um, a parameterized family of vector spaces. Well, we see that for every point in M, we've got some uh, vector space. So that's, um, that's great. Um, and it's possibly twisted. That may be harder to, to see immediately here. It looks like, okay, for every point in the sphere, I've got a vector space. They seem well-behaved. Um, in fact, there's gonna be some, uh, something about that well behavior in the definition uh, when we get there in a moment. Um, but the thing is, we um, let's now switch to thinking in terms of the, the, um, the functions. So a function in this case is going to mean, uh, so normally a function from S2 to say R2 would be for every point in S2, you have um, a, a, a vector in R2. And now instead of uh, for every point in S2, you have a vector in R2, for every point in S2, you have a vector in this particular, well, it would be a subspace of R3. Um, but once again, let, now let me recopy this one more time. What does that mean? Well, so here's, here's the X I've been picking on the whole time. And, and then in this, um, I'll, I'll again draw it in the affine space. In that affine space, going through it, I'll just pick a, a vector. And, um, and again, this would be, have to be translated back to the origin. So, and then over here, there's a point in X, and then I, I pick a vector. And over here, there's a point X, and I pick some vector. In this case, for every point on the sphere, I would have um, some vector which is, uh, normal to X, as we said, and that makes it tangent on the sphere. And you fill these all in and you, uh, you get something called a vector fields. So historically in physics, vector fields have been really important. Um, and vector bundles are really where vector fields live. Um, vector fields are sections of vector bundles. Um, so then um, a couple things to, to say, uh, like with the Mobius bundle, actually it's the case that these aren't uh, really like vector valued functions on S2. In particular, a vector valued function on S2, I could send every point in S2 to the same vector, say one zero or one one or something like that. Um, here, it's maybe a familiar fact, it's a classical fact in topology, which we will prove that um, all these vector fields um, must vanish somewhere, okay? So just like the Mobius bundle, if I thought of those uh, taking a point on the, um, the fiber of the Mobius bundle, a point on, 
on that vector space, um, then eventually uh, it looks like I had to sort of cross the origin in order to, to have a, a well-defined continuous section. Here, once again, to have a well-defined continuous section, um, if I put a vector field on the sphere, then someplace it, it must vanish. So that is, is a theorem. Um, if it's not familiar to you, you can, um, you can just try to uh, visualize this. You can think of uh, hair, one hair growing, say, pointing out of the, the sphere everywhere. That's something called the normal bundle. And then you try to, every hair growing out, you try to sit down flat. That's like combing your hair. Um, but the hair has to cover your whole head a little bit more than, than my hair covers my head for sure. And then if it covers your whole head, then, uh, and you try to comb it down, at some place there's a part that would be a discontinuity. Or in order to make things continuous, at some point you would be, um, you'd be letting those hairs get smaller and smaller and they can vanish somewhere. So, um, so this leads to the, the, the following, um, again, informal definition, um, but it's going to be, uh, so the first, we'll call the first numerical invariant of vector bundles. Um, and it's not going to be clear that this is invariant, but anyways, it's going to be the count of um, the zeros of um, a generic almost any section. Um, this is uh, either going to be the mod two count um, or um, in Z, you would have to count with signs. when things are oriented, when the bundle is oriented. So that's the most basic um, invariant of a vector bundle. And it's, um, this is called the, the Euler invariant. Um, again, I'm not making a, uh, I'm not gonna prove a claim of invariance uh, now. So in, so we call this the Euler E. And um, what, we're, uh, what we're claiming is that the Euler invariant of a Mobius bundle is one mod two and an Euler invariant of the tangent bundle of S2 is two. And let me say for my class and others who are trying to do this as a class, um, um, prove this, try to prove that, um, not necessarily that it's invariant, but that in all examples that you can find, at least um, these counts are what they are the first one actually you should be able to fully prove. Um, the second is going to be a little subtle, but um, do the best you can to say there seem to be two places where the any um, section of the tangent bundle of S2, any way to, to take a, a ball and put a vector which is tangent at every point. Um, and once you do that continuously, say smoothly, um, it's got to vanish twice. All right, so at least see that in examples. Okay, um, and maybe even in the second case, you might sort of provide some evidence against an almost counterexample uh, for this. Uh, there's some vector fields which 
which look kind of funny and um, in particular don't seem to vanish twice when you look at them. Um, but let me be a little bit opaque in order to, to allow people to have fun with that exercise. Okay, so let me get to the main then point of, of the lecture, which is now that we've seen some examples, again, we don't have a, um, we don't have a formal definition in front of us, but we've seen examples um, and, and we've thought about vector bundles as these geometric objects that then for every point in your manifold, you can associate uh, a point in that, uh, that vector space and that feels like a function, but behaves differently. There's these sections. So why should these vector bundles be measured by cohomology? So again, I like to have a one sentence description of a subject and as soon as possible, uh, an explanation for why that's a good one sentence description of a subject. That's sort of the pedagogy I'm trying to follow today. Um, well, there are um, more general reasons why vector bundles should sort of func in categorical functorial reasons. But for now, um, even before we have a definition, um, let's, let's uh, think about some, some possible properties of vector bundles which would lead to this. So first of all, um, I haven't given you a definition, but vector bundles restrict. Because I've got a parameterized family of vector spaces, well, if I take the parameter space and look at any subspace, I've got some parameterized um, family of vector spaces. So, so I can, um, you know, if I've got a vector bundle on a torus and I take a, a little circle in the torus, that gives me a vector bundle on the circle. Or for example, the tangent bundle of S2, I can take the circle in, inside like a, an equator and then I've got the, the tangent bundle um, of S2 restricted to the equator. That'll be a two dimensional vector bundle. In other words, for every point on the equator, I've still got a two dimensional vector space. We're gonna play some games though that says, oh, okay, well, the, the, the equator has its own tangent bundle and let's compare that ambient uh, tangent bundle from S2 to the tangent bundle of the equator. In any case, let's not go there right now. Let's just say vector bundles restrict. Um, Another fact is, uh, and we're often not used to thinking about homology this way, but if say X is a simplicial complex, then um, any then a generating homology class, so not like two times some other homology class um, is represented by a subcomplex which is a pseudo manifold. A pseudo manifold is just a simplicial complex um, where every um, Co-dimension one face is shared by two top-dimensional um, simplices. A good example is uh, S2 wedge S2, say in the, the form of tetrahedron wedge uh, cube or something like that. Um, all of the, the lines, all the edges are faces of exactly two top-dimensional, in this case, two-dimensional um, uh, simplices. Um, but you, do, you don't have a manifold because it's a wedge, you've got that special vertex, but somehow a pseudo manifold is just a, a really a co-dimension one thing. And, and the point is that, that if, we're, if you're doing simplicial homology, then you know, you've got your space X and then every, every cycle is, uh, is really some combination of things where because the boundaries um, add up to zero, they must occur, if I, if I think about the, the, these linear combinations, they have integer coefficients, but I'm gonna take five times something and think of it as you know, five times X is X plus X plus X plus X plus X. And then we know that somewhere else there was a minus X. 
And so, um, uh, and so you can sort of match up those uh, faces. Um, so maybe not represented by a subcomplex, I should really say, um, uh, is the image of a sub, uh, the, so represented by a um, complex mapping in. And, but sometimes it's a subcomplex. Um, if the complex is mapping in, then I'm going to have to say uh, vector bundles more generally uh, pull back. Again, this is this is trying to to motivate the subject. So I'll be true to to what's uh, well, what's true, but um, I'm not going to dwell on um, on making everything entirely rigorous. So then. Um, so if, if I've got then a vector bundle on X um, and then I restrict it to some cycle, maybe it's a nice one dimensional cycle like this. And again, if it crosses itself, then maybe I need to be a little bit more careful, but um, in any case, suppose it's a nice embedded cycle. So now I've got a vector bundle on this and maybe that's the Mobius bundle. And when I measure the, the sections, I get um, uh, one mod two when I'm measuring that bundle restricted to that cycle. And in general, then we see that uh, any numerical invariant, so taking E or other numerical invariants of this restriction thus gives well it's a it's a function on um, on homology so that is by the universal coefficient theorem an element of cohomology. So that in a nutshell is why uh, you should use cohomology to measure vector bundles um, because we can uh, any, you, you start as with many things in mathematics, you start with something numerical, you realize that this these numerical um, measures uh, sort of come in a package together. And in this case, they really, um, because you can restrict your vector bundle to any cycle and then make your numerical measures there, you really have some um, cohomology class in the background. And so we're gonna just use cohomology uh, from the start. But this gives you an idea of, of how, um, how one could sort of go from a more naive, again, standard thing in, in math is to define numerical invariants and then realize that, that these numbers have some structure in this case, these numbers are, are encoding co-chains. Okay, um, let me end the lecture by actually making a formal definition or two. Which I know is the, would normally be where folks start, but I wanted to start with the one sentence description. So, So a vector bundle is a um, pair, or I'll go ahead and say a triple of spaces um, I've got V, which is going to be a vector space, um, including into E, and then um, E projection onto B, and um, what we what we say is that um, V is um, pre-image of some point E, the base point, if we're in the base setting, which I um, yeah I'll try to be better about saying when we're based or not. For now, it's not 
think too much about base points, such that um, there's an open cover. Let's call it C of B with for any um, all U in the open cover, you have that the pre-image of U is um, homeomorphic to U cross R in. Um, and I'm gonna name this uh, this this is part of our data is going to be a fee u. Okay, so locally you look just like open set cross rn, but there's um, a, an important uh, compatibility among all of these um, these isomorphisms. Um, and again, let's just here let's. If I've got B, then an E is this blob here. Then for every U down here, um, I've got this cross some uh, Euclidean space is how that pre-image looks, right? So that would be, um, if that uh, Euclidean space was one, one dimensional, that's, that's how it would look. Um, but then the key compatibility is that, um, sorry, we have to nest our quantifiers here, so that um, for each U and say W in the cover um, and X in their intersection, so whenever they intersect, we're gonna consider the composite And that composite is what? Um, well, I'm gonna look at the pre-image of X um, and under this phi U restricted to um, X cross R N. So X cross R N is in U cross R N. So I, I can look at phi U and well, if I take a point and X cross Rn, that's just um, well, phi is going to give me an isomorphism with X cross Rn, which of course is just Rn. I mean little n here. Okay, but um, the preimage of X as under um, phi w restricted to x cross rn, same same deal is also isomorphic to. Um, now, of course, I've got to move over here. This is also going to be isomorphic to um, x cross rn. And, um, but these are, these are the same space, again, sitting inside of, um, of, of pi inverse, uh, well, sitting inside of E, right? So I've got this subspace, which is identified with um, Rn in two different ways, okay? And that's Rn or V um, is what we're, we're, the way we're thinking about it. And so, um, um, and, and these are isomorphisms. The phi maps general uh, go from um, from u cross r n to pi inverse. So they're going this way and this way. But now, if I take um, uh, 
take uh, phi u and compose it with phi w inverse, that's now a map from R in to R in. And we want that this is linear phi. OK. By the way, this is slightly different than the definition in Milner and Stashef, but I think it, um, I, I want to more explicitly say that, that in a vector bundle, you've got this total space E for any point in B, the pre-image is, is a vector space. We aren't, well, the first example is, um, let me just say over here, an example. is just B cross Rn. So that's certainly a space that for every point in B, you've got an element of Rn and um, it satisfies this with um, the open cover being B itself is open in B and is a, is a cover so that I've got this kind of isomorphism of the pre-image of B under the projection to uh, just B cross Rn, that's fine. Um, Say it more explicitly. Um, but in our examples, we see that things can be twisted that the, um, for example, in the Mobius bundle, as I go around the vector named one, if I start and go around the circle, it gets identified with a vector named minus one. So in a sense, there is no vector named one. Um, so that can't, you have to be careful about what's actually, uh, what we can say in a vector bundle. The fact that these maps are linear, then just means that, for example, I can add sections. So these sections are the, like these twisted vector valued functions. I can't name a section which is one everywhere in the Mobius bundle, but if I take two sections, I can add them. Uh, another thing that happens in a vector space is I've got zero. And of course, zero is preserved by a linear map. And so there's always gonna be this zero section, okay? So, so um, yeah. So I, I, you think about a vector bundle as um, you've got different, um, I should have drawn this picture before, but you've got different open sets. Um, and for every open set, then over here, I'm going to sort of draw it in a in a sort of skew way, but on this overlap here, this yellow overlap, I've got some translation between the sort of horizontal way that I'm thinking about those vector spaces in blue with the skewed way that I'm thinking about them in purple. So there's some linear transformations, and what you should think about is, um, and mo this will be true for. Um, almost all the vector bundles we deal with, you want to think about just a finite cover and then a finite number of these linear transformations being the data that really encodes a vector bundle. So, um, so I like to have the, these, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, these defining transformations, um, I'm forgetting their name right now. Uh, this is more the Steenrod point of view on vector bundles. I, I like to have them as part of the data. So let me wrap up with a couple things. So we've got the trivial bundle, as I said. Oops. Um, sorry. Um, this is called the trivial bundle. Um, but then, yeah, as we said, the Mobius bundle and the tangent bundle of M, in particular, the tangent bundle of S2, and an exercise for my students is to verify these, um, especially the Mobius bundle and the tangent bundle of S2. Bonus points if you can do the tangent bundle of M at this point. 
And let me then just say, let's get a second definition out there because it is so. Um, a section of a vector bundle is just a map. And that vector bundle, we, I'll write it all out here. Well, I'm not even writing it all out if you think about it. A vector bundle also means that there exists some system of, uh, of coordinates. Um, we haven't talked about how the vector bundle might depend on that system or anything like that. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, it doesn't. Um, but there's plenty of abuse for notate, plenty of opportunity for abusing notation when you've got this kind of definition with lots of data. So most often, I'm often going to just call it E. Um, uh, Milner and Stashef choose to just give a different letter for the name of all this data, C, but I, I often will just call it E, from, which is the total space, admittedly, um, but I'm comfortable with that. So if we, I've got a, a vector bundled in a section, is just a map. A priori discontinuous, but sometimes if we're doing um, differential geometry, it's smooth. Uh, S, and that's going to go from B to E, so that um, applying S and then back pi is the identity on B. So for every point in B, I've got an element of the, um, so, so that means that for all B in B, um, S of B is in the pre-image of B, which is a copy of V. So, um, so sections of vector bundles, again, they include things like um, vector fields. Um, Vector bundles are thus arguably the most uh, central kind of object in differential geometry. Um, you could say manifolds are, but you can't get very far studying manifolds without studying the tangent bundle. So um, yeah, those are some of the um, basics and we're gonna continue with definitions next time.